this month on spiritual warfare. We pray that God will continue to bless and watch over us as a congregation of his people. Let us pray together. Gracious, kind, and loving Father, we thank you for who you are, not so much about what you do, because what you do is solely based in who you are. Father, we want to take time right now in advance to say thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the privilege that you have afforded each of us who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ to be your children. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the privilege that we all have today to be in your presence, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray, Heavenly Father, now that as you speak to our hearts from your holy word, we pray, Heavenly Father, especially for ourselves, no one else, but that we ourselves will give ourselves wholly to you to be attentive to your word, that we lean not to the right or to the left or try to uh, see, Heavenly Father, who uh, amongst us needs your word, for we all need your word. We pray especially for them who know you not in the pardoning of their sin. Father, as we continue uh, to discuss spiritual warfare, we pray that we truly learn to put on the complete and full armor of God, that we may be able to stand against the schemes and devices of Satan. And Father, as we embark and endeavor to study uh, this text today, we pray, and I, we pray that you would help us to understand that the enemy is not so much out in the world as much as he is in the church. Help us to be attentive. Help us to be vigilant. Help us to be watchful. And may we take heed to ourselves that we give not place to the devil. We ask this prayer in faith and we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6 and a verse number 13. We're going to start right there and I'm uh, going to try my best to get through here. Uh, this morning I, I recognize I owe you about uh, 40 minutes from last week. Uh, but we'll be okay. Is that all right? Ephesians chapter 6 in the verse number 13, we concentrated on the verses 10 through 12 last week. We saw how we are exhorted to put on the whole armor of God that we may be made able by God himself and we understand that we don't stand uh, in our own might, in our own strength. We stand in the might and strength of God. Is that all right? Today we're going to focus on verse 13. And then next week we'll pick up on verse 14 uh, with those things that we are to specifically equip ourselves with. But uh, prayerfully, I, I thought it necessary to focus on verse 13 and I'm going to take us somewhere in the Old Testament because those things that were written for uh, were written aforetime were written for our learning and, and I understand that some of us may not appreciate some of the things that we may get into today but it's still needed amen about it is that all right so if you have Ephesians chapter 6 and the verse 13 say amen and the word of God says, wherefore take unto you 
Is that what your Bible says? Take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. Now I want to read how it actually reads in the original Greek text. Okay? It says, in the original text, it's, it reads like this. Because of this, all right? And understand he's saying because of this, because of what he just said in verse 12. And what he said in verse 12, just to remind us, he said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Is that all right? So he's reminding us because we're, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're, we're not wrestling against people. We have a, a greater enemy that we're wrestling against. Is that all right? We're wrestling against things that are, were created before man and that are superior to man, that are stronger than man. So we have to use the whole complete armor, the weaponry, offensively and defensively, that God has given us if we're going to stand against this enemy. Are we getting this? So he says, because of this, take up the complete armor of God so that you will be able. And again, what we looked at last week is this able means made able. Not that you and I are able in and of ourselves, but made able, strengthened, empowered by God and his might. Is that all right? That you, so that you will be able to withstand. That's a key word. Withstand is a military term. And it means made able to resist. Made able to oppose. Made able to be set against. It refers to being made able to take a firm and complete stand against evil. It means to be made able to hold one's ground without swerving or giving up. It means to be uh, made able to refuse to be moved or pushed back by the forces of evil and wickedness. And then he says, watch this, to withstand, notice what he says, in the evil day. Or in the Greek text it says, in the day of evil. And this is not so much talking about the forces themselves as much as it's talking about what accompanies fighting against evil. You see, it's this word evil is an adjective that describes and emphasizes the associated pains, the associated troubles, the associated miseries, and the inevitable agonies that always accompany having to deal with evil. In other words, when you and I have to deal with evil, it's not always a good day. Sometimes when you have to deal with evil, it, 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 sometimes your carnal man is like, oh man, here we go again. And you know it's going to be some, some agony, some, some, some troubles associated with that. Some misery associated with that. But you still have to stand. And that's why he says in the original text, and all things having done to stand. In other words, even though you're going to endure some miseries, even though you're going to have some agonies, you still do everything you can do to stand. You can't serve God and be a quitter. You see, we must.
us understand that as children of the Most High God, we must come to understand and accept that the evil day is every day. The evil day is every day. And, and I'm going to go a little bit further, and y'all just excuse me or pardon me. Is that all right? The evil day is every day, and especially for those who serve God in an official capacity. I said official. Let me break down what I mean by official. Ordained of God. And I'm not talking about you ordained yourself. I'm talking about those who are ordained of God. I'm not saying you went out and made yourself something. I'm saying God made you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And I, I'm saying this and I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit biased uh, because when you serve God in an official capacity, you, you, you can't just be vigilant about the things, standing against the things from the outside, but you also have to be vigilant about standing against the things from the inside. First and foremost, to yourself. So why do you say that? Because the Bible says in Acts chapter 20, in the verses 28 and 29, and I'm going to read from the NLT on this, Acts chapter 20, in the verses 28 and 29, the Apostle Paul, talking to the Ephesian elders, says, so guard yourselves. King James says, take heed unto yourselves. Is that all right? So guard yourselves and God's people. Notice he says God's people. Because sometimes when men serve, they think the people belong to them. Are we getting this? He says, feed and shepherd God's flock. His church. His church. His church. Purchased with his own blood. His own blood. Last time I checked, you and I haven't shed nothing. Is that all right? Purchased with his own blood over the which the Holy Spirit, notice, the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders or as servants. The Holy Spirit makes you whatever you are. Are we getting this? Notice why he says this. I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. So watch out. Be on your guard. You see, we need to understand the fact that the truth of the matter is for some people, it's not about God at all. It's about them. And that's why I want to call your attention to Numbers chapter 16. As we consider spiritual warfare, standing against the evil from within. Numbers chapter 16. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Numbers chapter 16. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Is that all right? And I, I just, before we get into this, we start with verse one, but I, I really want to applaud my brother Edward, who took time to seek out, Brother Parker, how do you pronounce these names? That's a young man who takes it serious about what he's called to do. 
Is that all right? He said, I don't want to get up there and, and, and not pronounce these names right. Amen for you, brother. Is that all right? Numbers chapter 16, starting with verse 1. If you have it, say amen. Okay? Standing against the evil from within. See, we talked about the schemes and the devices of the enemy last week. But we have to understand how the enemy, and we learned this on yesterday, amen, in our classes on yesterday, our new semester on yesterday, amen, somebody. We learned that one of the biggest issues in the church is immaturity, fussing and fighting, backbiting and devouring one another. And God is looking at us, he's looking at us saying, listen, with you guys acting like our work is not being done. My work. Are we getting this? Number 16, verse 1. Let's go ahead. Now Korah, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan in Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel. 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. So you have to understand that uh, Korah, Abiram and Dathan and on, they went and they intentionally sought out people in the congregation who had influence with other people. And they united themselves against Moses and Aaron. Are we getting this? And, and this is, uh, when you really do the history of this, this, this is remarkable because in this lineage, it points out that Korah was the son of Kohath, or, or the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi. So Korah was the great grandson of Levi, which actually makes him a cousin of Moses and Aaron. You say, well, why are you pointing that out? Because Jesus said your foes will be of your own household. Yes, indeed. Matthew 10, 36. And a man's foes or enemies shall be they of his own household. Then he pointed out Jesus in Matthew 12 and 25. And every city or every house divided against itself shall not stand. And we have to understand that in the church dispensation, uh, we're just not friends in here. We're a family. We're brothers and sisters. Oh, we're getting this. So they united themselves. Verse 3 says, They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves. Another translation says it like this, you've gone too far. For all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Y'all see what they're doing? You see, the enemy and his schemes always works by making an accusation. Y'all have gone too far, man. Why are y'all acting like y'all greater than everybody else? God is working through all of us. We're all blessed. And understand they were all blessed. Is that all right? But this is one of the, the, the tools of the enemy to try to always uh, win favor with people and win the support of people by making an accusation that some injustice was done. Are y'all getting this? Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Notice verse 4. 
So when Moses heard it, are y'all there? So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. Is that what your Bible says? When Moses heard it, he fell on his face. You see, whenever you get some foolishness that comes from the enemy, the first thing you have to do as a servant of God is fall on your face and pray to God. Because the enemy wants you to just react by your emotions. And some people try to provoke you by your emotions. But you have to be wise enough to understand that I can do nothing but fail without God. So he fell on his face. And that's figurative. In other words, he started praying to God for wisdom, for guidance. And I'm here to tell you, whenever something comes your way from the enemy, the first thing you need to do is fall on your face and pray to God. You pray to him for guidance, you pray to him for wisdom, and you pray to him for strength. Are we getting this? And this is a company with us in, in the whole armor because when we go to Ephesians verse chapter 6 and in verse 18, the Bible says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. In other words, we have to put on all of our armor, but we also need to pray. We need to be in constant communication with God so that we don't lean upon our own understanding and do what we want to do. Now this is going to be key as we go through here, all right? I need to hasten. So when Moses heard it, verse 4, he fell on his face, face, and he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, tomorrow morning, you see, this is after he prayed, tomorrow morning, the Lord will show who is his and who is, his, who is holy and will cause him to come near to him. Is that all right? The Lord will show. Notice Moses didn't take it upon himself to say, I'm going to show y'all. No, the Lord will show who's his. The Lord will show who can come near him. Is that all right? Now, this is important because watch what he says. That one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near him. All right? You say, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not following. You have to understand, you have to go back to Exodus chapter 28, starting with verse 1. God had already commanded and set the foundation and authorized who it was who can come near him. God had already said that. Just anybody, Levite or not, could approach God. Only the lineage of Aaron, only Aaron and his sons were commanded and authorized by God to come near him. And even when they came near him, they had to come to him as God had commanded specifically. Y'all remember Leviticus chapter 10 with Nadab and Abihu? They were sons of Aaron. They had permission to come near God. But they came to God with a strange fire. With something that God didn't command them to do. And what did God do? God burned them up. God is teaching us when you come to me, you come to me how I told you and not how you want to. Are we getting this? Listen. He says, that one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near him. Verse 6, do this. Take cinder, sisters, Korah, and all your company. Put fire in them and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. Listen, they had said earlier, Moses, you guys take too much on yourselves. You've gone too far, but look at what Moses says. You take too much on yourselves. In other words, you've gone too far, you sons of Levi. You have to understand, Korah and those guys, they were Levites. Are we getting this? 
You take too much on yourselves. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to serve them, and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you? And are you seeking the priesthood also? You say, what's going on? Listen, Moses is saying, listen, you, you, you guys are Levites. God already separated you from the people. Amen. This is, you can find this back in Numbers chapter 3. God had already separated the Levites as a special people for himself to serve Israel. So Moses is saying, listen, God has already separated you. God has already made you special. And even that's not enough for you. You're already special in the Lord. You already have a special work to do. And now that you ain't satisfied with that, you also want to be the priest. And some of us, when we get into the, the house of God, we're not satisfied with where God has chose us to be because the Bible says, now he has set every member in the body as it has pleased him. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 18. He has set every, each member in the body as it has pleased him. Are we getting this? So he said, listen, Cora, you guys, really, you're not satisfied with already the work that God has separated you for? You want the priesthood too? And I'm here to tell you, some people don't even know what they're asking for. Some people want to do certain works in the church, and they don't even understand all that comes with it. Man, this is more than a notion. I wish I had time to go back to Numbers 11, where Moses got to a point where he told God, listen, man, did I birth these people? Did I give birth to these people? You want me to do this? You just if, if you're going to treat me like this, God, just take my life. You have no idea. Everything you have to endure with serving the Most High God. You think some people think this that this is something to be grasped. Man, you have to put your whole family on the line. You got to put up with disrespect, hatred, evil speaking, everything. People trying to mess with your children, everything. You say, well, the devil messes with us all. Absolutely he does, but especially the servants of God. So goes the servants, so goes the church. The enemy knows that. Are we getting this? Listen. Verse 11. Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. See, he lets them know who you're really rebelling against. Listen to what he says. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? You, you complaining against Aaron, you guys have gone too far, man. You, you're not greater than the congregation. Who are we that you complain against us? He said, who you really complain against is God. But you have to understand, in this whole context, 8 through 11, or 8 through 12, Moses has to go to him and tell him. You say, why is that important? Because servants of the Most High God cannot be afraid of confrontation. Confrontation is from the enemy is always going to come. If you're a child of God, you can't be afraid of confrontation. 
Can't be a coward. Is that all right? Listen. He says, therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? And Moses, watch this, verse 12. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram. Because guess what? He confronted Korah. Now he's got to confront the other guys. Amen. You see, you got to, when, when you understand who it is that's rebelling, you got to confront everybody. Amen. But there's also some secret people in there too. Yes, indeed. They had out. They've been had out for years. They just wait for an insurrection. Y'all ain't getting what I'm saying. See, they, they don't have the courage to be Korah, Abiram, and Dathan. They just sit on the sidelines and wait for somebody else to act foolish. Then they read their evil head. Is that all right? Then when they go down, they act like they had no part in it. What me? Is that all right? Are we getting this? Listen. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. Well, watch this. But they said, we will not come. We won't win. We're not coming up. Notice what that says. Verse 13. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you've not brought us into the land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us an inheritance of the fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Some people are just flat out disrespectful. No bones about it. Just disrespectful. Out of pocket. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Listen, then Moses, verse 15, I have to get through here. Then Moses was very angry. Can you blame him? Moses was very angry. And he said to the Lord, do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt one of them. You see, you can be angry, but don't sin. Don't, don't allow the enemy to cause you to dishonor God by a wrong response. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.26, be ye angry and sin not. In other words, be angry without sinning. In your anger, do not sin. Because you're just going to have to accept the fact that some are simply disrespectful. They, they think that they're being disrespectful to you, but they're actually being disrespectful to God. And we don't, we can't see for the life of us when I disrespect those who God has ordained as his servant, I'm actually disrespecting God. Disrespectful, passive aggressive, rejecting authority. Some people just don't like authority. And it's amazing how you can come into God's house and not have respect for authority, but you'll be on time tomorrow when you go to work. You'll do what they say. You'll follow all the policies and procedures. But when something is said or done in the church, you're ready to raise some hell. So he says, do not respect their offering. And you'll see later as we go through here, he says, do not respect their offering, not because of selfish reasons, but because of what God had already commanded. In other words, when you pray for something like this, when you ask for God for something like this, it has to be still in accordance to God's will. You cannot take it personal. Are we getting this? He says, do not respect the offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt one of them. 
In other words, you don't render evil for evil. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. You let God handle that. Is that all right? Verse 16, y'all with me? We're almost done. And Moses said to Korah, tomorrow you and all your company be present before the Lord. You and they, as well as Aaron. Let each take his censer and put incense in it. And each of you bring his censer before the Lord. 250 censers, both you and Aaron, each with his censer. So every man took his censer and put fire in it. Now remember we said earlier that back in Exodus 28, and you also find uh, this in Exodus 30, you find this in Leviticus chapter 6, and especially Leviticus 16, because putting incense and fire therein has to do with atonement, the day of atonement. And this was only commanded for the priest. The priest and his sons, Aaron and his sons. Is that all right? So he says, verse 18, so every man took his censer and put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. Are y'all getting this? And the Lord spoke to who? Why, why, why is he not speaking to Korah? Wait a minute. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, separate yourselves from among this congregation. You see, Korah and those guys had gathered, had, had so much influence, they had gathered the congregation against them. So God said, listen, Moses and Aaron, separate yourself from among the congregation. Is that all right? Why? Why, Lord? That I may consume them in a moment or instantly. God ain't playing. Are we getting this? But, but you got to understand, this, this, verse 22. Then they fell on their faces. Wait a minute. Brother Willie. Moses and Aaron fell on their faces. Wait a minute. Are y'all getting this? They got the whole congregation gathered against them. And God says, separate yourselves. I'm about to kill them. And they fall on their faces. And said, oh God, the God of, of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation? In other words, God, listen. Don't, don't hurt the people because of these fools. Spare the people, God. Amen, somebody. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the congregation. Go help them out saying, get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. In other words, guess what? When you're going to correct somebody, when you're going to confront somebody, you got to call them by name. Are you getting this? So God hears their prayer and say, okay, well, you go and you tell the people, amen, who are ignorantly following these fools, you go tell them they better get away from them guys. They better get her out from under their influence. Is that all right? Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. 
See, when you're ignorant, when you're naive, and when you're simple, you can go along with people that will get you in trouble to lose your soul. So you better understand that you need to check up in the book to make sure you're following God and not somebody. Servants or no servants, you follow God. Is that all right about it? Are we getting this? So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives and their sons and their little children. You see, this is important because the decisions you make don't just affect you. They will affect your entire family. Is that all right? And Moses said, by this, you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I've not done them of my own will. In other words, Moses is saying, listen, it's not about me. By this, you should know that the Lord has sent me. And I've not done this of my own will. Because some people will try to make it seem like you're just doing what you want to do. Amen about it. Verse 29, watch this. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. In other words, here's the test. If these men die a natural death, then I'm the one who's wrong. But if the Lord creates a new thing and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them and they go down, watch this, alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. You see, again, some people are deceived into thinking that I'm just going against men and they have no idea or clue that they're actually resisting God. Verse 31. Now it came to pass, as he finished speaking all these words, that the ground split apart under them, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah, with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive in the pit. The earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry. In other words, the people heard them screaming from being swallowed up. All Israel heard and fled at their cry for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. Let's get out of here. Is that all right? And a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. Again, they had no business offering incense because they were unauthorized. So they suffered the same fate as Nadab and Abihu. Keep this in mind. Unauthorized. Are we getting this? Verse 36, then Moses spoke, I'm sorry, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, tell Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, to pick up the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy, and scatter the fire some distance away. The censers of these men who sinned against their own souls, let them be made into hammered plates as covering for the altar because they presented them before the Lord, therefore they are holy. They shall be assigned to the children of Israel. So Eleazar the priest took the brown censers, brown censers 
which those who were burned up had presented, and they were hammered out as a covering on the altar to be a memorial, get this, to be a memorial to the children of Israel that no outsider who is a descendant of Aaron should come near to offer incense before the Lord. In other words, the Lord is saying, listen, I want you to take what they tried to offer me, hammer it, and cover the altar with it so that it will be and serve as a memorial and an example that only those who have authorized can come to burn incense. I want a memorial. I want an example for the people. You better not act like those guys. Is that all right? To be a memorial to the children of Israel that no outsider who is a descendant, who is not a descendant of Aaron, should come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he might not become like Korah and his companions, just as the Lord has said to him through Moses. In other words, people, young people especially, older people especially, you don't always have to learn by experience. You can learn from someone else's faults. You don't have to go through the same things that you've seen other people do. Learn from their faults. Because there's a lot of pain and misery associated with having to go through some of these things. Now we're at our end. You see, we have to understand that God leaves examples to all of us that he will not tolerate things in his house. Is that all right? Verse 41. And we're going to finish with this. On the next day, Lord have mercy. On the next day, are y'all seeing this? On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron saying you have killed the people of the Lord. You see, we always say God has a remnant. The enemy always has a remnant too. But his won't last. They complained. And they say, you've killed the people of the Lord. You see, you have to understand the schemes of the enemy. Sometimes the enemy is so influential among people that they're actually those who are sympathizers to those who do wrong. Are y'all getting this? Osama bin Laden is dead. We all know that, right? But he has a lot of people still doing wrong because they're sympathizers for him. They're sympathizers to his cause. So now they hate America even more so, even though this man is dead and gone. So you sometimes have people who God has taken out but there remain sympathizers to those people who God removed, and they still cause problems. Hmm. Listen. Verse 42. Now, it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting, and suddenly the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting. Look at this now. Look at this. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, get away from among this congregation that I may consume them instantly or in a moment. God is saying, you, you, you got to be kidding me. I just took out the murmurers and, and the ones who did it deliberately, now you guys ignorantly still want to cause some problems. That's it. Moses, Aaron, separate yourselves. I'm going, I'm going. Lord have mercy. So Moses, listen, and they fell on their faces. 
and they fell on their faces. Y'all ain't getting this. And they fell on their faces. The same people that didn't listen in the first place that they fell on their faces for, now they're falling on, they're falling on their faces again for the same people. They fell on their faces. So Moses said to Aaron, listen, take a censer and put fire in it from the altar. Put incense on it and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. Y'all ain't getting this. The Lord just said, Aaron, did you hear God? He said, I'm about to destroy them. Hurry up, man. Go grab some incense. Go grab the scissors. Grab the incense. Pull fire. Hurry up. Willie, hurry up. You come. Hurry up. All right? Make atonement for them. Lord have mercy, Willie and Yukon. I'm, I'm glad it wasn't me. Some of y'all will get that on the way home. Mark would have just been like, go ahead, Lord, take care of them. Burn them up. But you see, God has a message for all of us. God is teaching them. All right? Listen. He says, make atonement for them, for the wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Then Aaron took, or then Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran in the midst of the assembly. And already the plague had begun among the people. So he put the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living so the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague, this one, were 14,700. Beside, besides those who died in the Korah incident. So in addition to Korah and those guys, God killed 14,700 more before Moses and Aaron interceded on their behalf. The plague stopped. You say, what's the message? We're going to finish right here. What's the message? Understand that the same hands that were rebelled against initially were the same hands that saved in the end. You getting this? The same ones you rebelled against were the same ones who prayed and interceded on your behalf to save your soul. The same ones. The same ones. You say, what are you trying to say? Servants are, are gods? No. This is a message. This is about Christ. Because Moses and Aaron were a type of Christ. And when we have offended God, Jesus has still interceded on our behalf to make us right with God. And we have the nerve and the audacity to still rebel. He shed his blood on a cross for you. And you have the audacity to act like you are law unto yourself. Lord, have mercy on each of us. You see, Korah 
And those guys did the same thing that Aaron did. But it was unauthorized. Unauthorized will lead to destruction. While authorized will lead to salvation. You can follow unauthorized doctrine all you want to. But that's going to ultimately lead to destruction. You have to follow authorized doctrine. Because that's the only type authorized doctrine. That's the only one that will save you and I. Romans 6.17 still says, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, that mold. There's no other. No other will save you. I want to encourage you before we extend the invitation, I want to encourage each of us to truly examine ourselves to make sure that we follow God, humble ourselves because God resists the proud. God does not need you and me. We need him. We need to put our emotions and our feelings aside. You have to understand, each time where God is leading his people to higher ground, there's necessity of a cleansing that needs to take place. Is that all right? We shared with you over the past years and so much, we need to increase our faith. We need to increase our reliance upon God. We need to be built up. This is not a time to just sit and be complacent. This is not a time to be in your feelings. We all need to mature. This is an admonition. You say, well, who are you? I'm nobody. But in Titus 2.15, the evangelist has authority. Not of himself, but of God. To teach those things God commanded. And then he told Titus, let no one despise you. Just like he told Timothy, let no one despise your youth. But he told Titus, let no one despise you. Let no one look down on you. Let no one uh, use their own personal bias to try and discredit what you have to say. You say, are you, you trying to threaten them? No, I'm trying to give you an admonition. And guess what? I got to take heed to it first. If we don't grow up, if we don't mature, God will take us out. We just have the example. You say, you was preaching to me today. Yes, I was. Yes, I was. So don't come and ask me after service, was you preaching to me? Yes, I was. Don't call me this week and ask me, were you preaching to me? Yes, I was. Got to cut this foolishness out. Yes, I was preaching to you. You, 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 all of you. I've said enough. God has spoken. It's up to us to obey. Is that all right? You're here today, you're not obeyed the gospel. We want to extend you to extend to you the greatest invitation ever known to man. 
the greatest invitation. You've heard the word of God. Do you believe it? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith only comes by hearing the word of God. No other way. He that come to God must believe that he is. Must believe. He that believeth, Jesus said. What we hear by faith, we have to believe. Once we believe it, we have to be willing to repent. What we heard and believed. We have to be, we have to be willing to repent and turn from our ways. Because our ways lead to death. Is that all right? We have to be willing then to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 5, 18, what does that mean? That Jesus Christ is the Son of God that makes him God. He is God. He is deity. Is that all right? And that God raised him by the power of the Holy Spirit. God raised him from the dead. The firstborn of the dead. Confess that before men. You said that's what saves me? You're on your way. You ain't there yet. Because Jesus said in Mark 16, 15 and 16, he that believeth and is, coordinating conjunction, and is baptized. Is that all right? And is baptized. You have to obey. Jesus Christ is the author of eternal salvation to all those who just don't have faith in him, but all those that obey him. We have to have faith and obedience. Acts 2.38 Repent and be baptized every one of you. 1 Peter 3.21 Baptism doth now save. It's not about the water. It's about the one who told us to get into the water. Amen. And after our baptism now we can be taught all those things we need to be taught. And the, the teaching process is unique because not only are you taught the word of God, but now you have to unlearn things that you've been taught all your life. That's, that's equally as important. And sometimes we think we can hold on to some of the things that we learn in our former life. You have to die to yourself. And dying is a, is a painful process. The Lord said, be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. That's Bible. That's the book. For those of us who have obeyed the gospel, let us understand. Let us understand. Let us please understand that we have to stand against the evil from within. First and foremost, taking heed to ourselves. Let us be not a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way.